Welcome back to this live webcast from the floor of the Washington, D.C. Auto Show. And joining me right now is Margot Oge from the EPA. In fact, I've, I've got to read your title because okay. I can't commit this to memory. <laughs> it's complicated. The Director of Office of Transportation and Air Quality, which essentially means that you're in charge of anything to do with air quality for transportation. Is that right? And beyond. And beyond. <laughs> like non-road, like rail, rail, you know, locomotives, mm -hmm. marine engines, like ocean-going vessels, mm -hmm. uh, aircrafts. Anything with transportation. Anything that moves. So, Margo, what, what's on your legislative agenda right now? What is at the top mm -hmm. of your priority mm -hmm. of what you're trying to mm -hmm. drive as it pertains to the auto yeah, yeah, industry? Yeah. Well, John, first of all, let me say that this has been a great day I'm here to observe all the incredible technologies that companies are introducing. Clearly, what they're trying to do here is to address energy security, clean environment, and at the same time, um, maintain consumer choice. So I think we're going to see a big success out of this type of vehicles introduced in the United States and beyond. Uh, last May, as you remember, the president announced the clean car program. The administrator spoke about it today. So we're working um, around the clock with our colleagues from NHTSA to put together this program and finalize it by end of March. So this program is going to affect vehicles, new vehicles introduced in the marketplace starting 2012 to 2016. The good news is going to be not only we're going to have cleaner vehicles, maintaining consumer choice, but at the same time we're going to have one vehicle for the country. Because the state of California, as you know, has agreed to defer to the federal program in 2012. Which 12, has been critical for is, automakers to have been one standard. Very, very critical. So that's what we're doing right now. At the same time, uh, we're working um, very hard to finalize the renewable fuel standard. Uh, this is a program, again, that the administrator spoke this morning. Um, as you remember, in 2007, President Bush signed into law a requirement of 36 billion gallons of renewable fuel by 2022, which is about 11 percent uh, reduction of gasoline and diesel use in the marketplace by using these renewable fuels. Um, we proposed the program last year. There was um, some significant controversy associated with it. Uh, we are getting to ready to announce this program very soon, um, and, um, and that is a very important program for energy security, for climate change, and, and clearly for green jobs in the United States. Uh, the other thing that we're working on that's going to be probably very interesting to your viewers is, is we're looking at these new technologies, plug-in hybrids, electric vehicles, fuel cells. We're really talking about electrons versus liquid fuel. So the question, the challenge is how do we communicate this information to the potential buyers of these vehicles. I mean, is MPG going to be the most meaningful metric to communicate uh, the, you know, the performance of those vehicles? So EPA is working with a number of stakeholders, including the industry, to reassess the existing uh, fuel economy label for new vehicles and trying to figure out what is the best way of, what's the best metric uh, to introduce this new technology, but also existing technologies, and what is the best design for these fuel economy labels, so we can properly allow the consumer to compare one technology versus another. That's got to be a dilemma for the EPA, because I imagine if you left it to the scientists and the engineers, it'd be easy. It's kilowatt hours <laughs> or whatever it happens to be. But you hit the nail on the head, I think, yeah. by saying, how yeah. do you communicate it to the yeah. public, yeah. for whom yeah. most of us, kilowatt hours, what the I heck know. does that I mean? Know. Know. Many of us don't even know how much kilowatt hours we consume running a refrigerator or a washing machine in our computers. Uh, so that's going to be a big chance. I think engineers have a role to play, uh, but also it's going to be very crucial to get out to understand how the public thinks about those vehicles. And how do we need to communicate um, the performance of these vehicles? So where do you think it's going to go? Do you have any gut feel? Is, is it going to stay with miles per gallon? Because as you know, there was a huge controversy when General Motors said the Volt's going to get 230 mm -hmm, mm -hmm. miles to the gallon or whatever mm -hmm, the exact mm -hmm, number was. Mm -hmm. And Nissan said, oh yeah, well, we're yeah, going to get this. Yeah. And others were saying, wait a minute. 
you know, pure electrics don't use any gasoline at all. The yeah. extended range one, how do you figure out between electric and, and the yeah. fuel that you burn? Yeah. It? Uh, John, I don't know the outcome. Clearly, um, the regulatory authority that EPA has by which we're deriving this label requires that MPG is presented. Uh, how big the MPG numbers, you know, where you're going to put them in the label necessarily, you know, will be a decision that the agency will make. But we want to look at MPG, we want to look at um, other metrics like um, dollars uh, per, per week spent, you know, dollars per hundred miles. You know, people are concerned about how much money am I going to spend when I buy this new vehicle? You know, what's going to cost me? How much money am I going to spend on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis, on a daily basis, commuting back and forth to work? I think uh, the, the, the money metric is going to be very important. Also, we want to consider to what extent some sort of a metric that deals with green mm -hmm. uh, is important to the consumer. But I don't know, because we haven't yet done focus groups and do all our research. Mm -hmm. uh, to, to We've been talking a lot uh, uh, about so many different things uh, on this show, and we're getting a little bit uh, down on time here, but w one of the themes that we seem to be coming back to on this show is, is diesel, and I know you've yeah, spoken yeah, very highly yeah, of diesel yeah. in the past. How do you rate yeah. its chances as emerging as a, a significant alternative? Yeah. You know, as we're looking in the future years, you know, 2011 and beyond, 2016, 2018, 2020, um, clearly, in, in our view, the existing gasoline, cleaner gasoline, more efficient gasoline engines will continue to play a very important role. But also clean diesel, because nowadays we can put clean next to diesel. I believe it's going to be a very important strategy to allow us to reduce fuel consumption, improve its efficiency of the engines, but also reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And we have seen um, in the show, the show today, and I was in the Detroit Auto Show, uh, a lot of progress from uh, a number of companies, especially European companies, in introducing clean diesel um, engines in the marketplace. So I, I have a lot of hope for clean diesel and also hybrids. You know, I mean, I was talking also to Mercedes when I was in Detroit Auto Show, and they're introducing a diesel hybrid mm -hmm. in Europe, and they expect to introduce something similar at some point in the United States. So all this techno the exciting, if I was an auto engineer, I would be pretty excited today. <laughs> because. Think about all these technologies that have a huge potential to address climate, to address energy security, and for domestic jobs. Anywhere from, from cleaner gasoline, more efficient gasoline, clean diesels, hybrids, hybrid diesels, electrics, plug-in hybrids, fuel cells. Uh, so if I was an auto engineer, I would have a lot of fun. <laughs> you, you would have a lot of fun, absolutely. And I, I love your approach, Margaret, of saying consumer choice. You yes, want to put everything yes, on the yes, table yes. and let whatever technology win, yeah. win. Yeah. And you necessarily, you know, we don't want to put standards in place that force the consumer to a small car. You know, there has been a lot of misinformation about our clean car program, that what we're doing is we're forcing people to smaller cars. That's not the case. But going back to smaller cars, smaller cars also can be very safe, and they are very safe. Mm -hmm. But what we're doing in our clean car programs is we recognize the footprint, the existing footprint, what the consumers have a choice. You know, the consumer wants to buy a minivan or a pickup truck or an SUV or subcompact or a compact. They should be able, within those classes, to be able to purchase a vehicle that meets, that's clean, at the same time allows them uh, the utility that they're looking for. So that's very important for us. And that's a good note to end this up on. Thank Margo, you, okay, thank you so much for coming in and bringing us up to speed on all the different things that the EPA is working on, especially as it reports to you. Great, and thank you for talking to me. Take oh, care. My pleasure.